If only Daryl had a little bit of a country flair to us. You have to work on that, Daryl. Actually, that was a great song. Um, First Kings, let's just, let me just say 17 and 18. I know that I'm not going to preach verse by verse, every verse from 17 and 18, but uh, I am going to look through. You know, it's a new year. Um, thinking about the year ahead for us as a church, you know, it's one of the things that, that I do and what I think about it. For things that I'd like to see happen, things that I'd like to do, and I have some things in my mind, and they'll, they'll, they'll come out eventually. But, um, you know, one of the obstacles for a church like this, and, and when I say like this, I mean sort of a traditional church that's, that's been here a long time and been in this community a long time. One of, the, one of the obstacles that a church like this has to face is, is their own mindset. And it's a mindset of our best days are behind us. Now, and, and I can see where a church can get that from. Uh, first of all, probably, um, and I don't know when, I should have done a little research, but I'm going to say probably maybe 60s, 70s, any of you that were here during that time, probably this church was, was pretty happening during the 70s and, and 60s. And, and it's easy to, you know, to look back at a time like that and to say, you know, the best days of the church are, are behind them. And the thing is, culturally, just culturally, um, things have changed. The community, you know, back in the day, the community sort of revolved around the church. The community... Um, you know, you didn't have Little League on Wednesday nights. I'm just saying. And you certainly didn't have baseball on Sunday. I'm just saying. I, the community was a little more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They were a little more in tune uh, with the things of the church. And so, so I realized that culturally we're different. Uh, we're in a different time. And I realized that, that it's not, we're, we're, we're past that season where, Church is what you do, and church is what you've always done, and, and that sort of thing. But what I guess what I want to say is, I just believe that if we, as the people of God, become empowered by the Spirit of God, with the purpose of glorifying God, the best days of this church don't have to be behind us. In fact, the best days of this church can be in front of us. The best days of this church can, can be in the future. And that's, look, uh, Second, Second Chronicles 16, 9. This is just sort of a verse I want to just, just throw in there right here. Uh, this is a time where uh, God is reminding um, uh, Asa uh, about, about um, one time where he trusted the Lord and won, and one time where he didn't trust the Lord and he was defeated. And he says that the eyes of the Lord, chapter 16, verse 9, the eyes of the Lord run to and, thro, to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly, therefore now uh, you shall have wars. So the, the part that I want to focus on there is that he tells him, he says, look, the, the eyes of the Lord are going back and forth across the earth, and they are looking for someone who is devoted to them to him they are looking for people who are devoted to him so that he can show himself strong through them listen i'm just i don't want to walk into this thing you're welcome thank you um i believe that that i guess principle is still true i believe that god is just looking I believe that God is looking for a church. God is looking for a group of people. God is looking for a body of Christ. God is looking for his church to see if his church will be devoted to him and sanctified to him and set aside for him, that they would be devoted to him so that he could show himself strong through that church and through those people. And I believe that God wants to do that through us. But we are going to have to be a people that God can show himself strong through. We're going to have to be, listen to this, get, get, get ready to hear this a lot too. And I've never used this before. Get ready. We need to be the people of God 
empowered by the Spirit of God with the purpose of showing forth the glory of God in this community. And when we can come to that place, I believe that we open ourselves up to, the, to, to, to God being able to use us to work in us and to work for, through us. So the story of, really the story goes before 1 Kings, but uh, I mean it goes before verse, chapter 17 and 18. But what you have here is you have at this point in time, so Israel would say that its heyday was in its past. It would say that, that its glory was during the days of David and during the days of Solomon. And when Solomon died, actually the kingdom split and it divided up. Uh, they couldn't get together and they couldn't agree on just about anything. And so they had uh, rulers uh, among both sides. And so, so you have here at this time, you have uh, Ahab becomes the king of Judah. Ahab, it says, did evil more than all of the kings that were before him. He was wicked. And he married a woman uh, named Jezebel. Jezebel was not even uh, an Israelite. She was, and he married her uh, to, um, to create an alliance uh, with, with the country that her father was the king of. So he marries her to create this alliance. She's from a completely different nation. She's from a completely different culture. And she worships and serves completely different gods. And so she brings her gods, Baal and Asherah, uh, over to the nation of Israel. And gradually over time, the people begin to worship these gods and they begin to serve these gods. Chapter 17, enter Elijah. So Elijah is a prophet of God. And Elijah just uh, busts onto the scene. I mean, he just, really, he just appears. and He doesn't just appear, but uh, we don't know anything about him. Chapter 17, verse 1, he's talking to Ahab, and he says, guess what, Ahab? It's not going to rain until I say so. It's going to stop raining starting right now, and it's not going to start raining again until I say it's going to start raining again. Now, obviously, we know that he was sent by God to do that. And so then he runs off. He has an encounter at the Brook Cherith. He has an encounter at a place called Zarephath, and we're going to look at these a little bit more in a minute. And then when it's time, it's time for it to start raining, it's three years later, I believe, it's time for it to start raining, and he goes back to Ahab. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to call all the people to the top of Mount Carmel. I want you to gather them together at the top of Mount Carmel. And not only do I want you to gather the people together, I want you to gather all of the prophets to, to, to Baal and to Asherah, these false prophets to these false gods that you worship. I want you to gather them as well on the top of Mount Carmel. And so they all gather together. And Elijah, this is a story you guys know, I'm, uh, I mean, probably. So Elijah comes to the people and he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to determine once and for all who is truly God. And we're going to say that the God who can bring down fire is the one true God. And so he tells them to go first and, and uh, they build an altar and they erect an altar and they begin doing everything that they do and, you know, they're dancing around and they're crying out to God and, you know, it gets a little more frenzied and, you know, it's really not part of my sermon, but Elijah, he kind of starts taunting them a little bit. He's like, mm, maybe your God's taking a nap. Or maybe you should cry out scream. Maybe he's gone away. He's taking a little trip. Maybe, you know, he went to the Caribbean or something. I don't know. And maybe he's taking a little trip. Maybe you should call louder. And so they really get, get in a frenzy and they get worked up. And, and obviously, a false God cannot produce fire. And so it doesn't happen. And so then Elijah calls all the people and he says, gather around me. And it's in verse 30. Elijah said to all the, verse 30 of chapter 18. Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Here's, I guess, the main point that I'm wanting to make today. If we want to see the glory of God in the future, we need to repair the altar. We need to repair the altar as a people of God in our own lives. We need to repair the altar as the body of Christ and as the church of God in this community. We need to rebuild and we need to repair the altar. Now listen, I, 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 I am 
I am putting an emphasis on the fact that he didn't just walk over there and use an altar that had been built to Baal. He actually repaired an altar that had been built and dedicated to Jehovah God. He actually took an altar that had been built and dedicated to God. It had suffered neglect, but he rebuilt that altar. He repaired that altar. We need to repair so that we can begin to offer the spiritual sacrifices that we need to offer on an altar that is dedicated and committed to the Lord. Too many of us are trying to offer spiritual sacrifices to Jehovah God on an altar of the world. We're trying to offer, we're trying to live in both worlds. We're trying to do both things. We're trying to take an altar of the world. We're trying to take the altar of our family, the altar of our success, the altar of our job, the altar of the things that we want to have. We are trying to make a dedication to the Lord, but offer it to Him on a false altar. We need to offer to God the sacrifices acceptable to Him upon an altar that is dedicated and given over to him we need to repair the altar we need to repair the altar of worship and of prayer and 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 of faith and some of these things that we're going to talk to talk about in in just a minute as we as as we look at this but we need to repair the altar of when was the last time you prayed you don't have to answer that out loud ask yourself that When's the last time you really took five minutes and you sat down somewhere and you were quiet and you, you poured your heart out to God, you took a minute to listen to God and let him speak to you? When was the last time you did that? When was the, how many of you woke up this morning and before you came to church, you had to find your Bible? How many of you it was still in the car? Sorry. How many of you have an altar that you need to repair? How many of you have an altar of dedication to the Lord and commitment to the Lord that you need to repair? How about as a church? When was the last time we gathered together and you truly felt like you worshiped God? Let me tell you, worship really isn't about a feeling. Worship isn't even about uh, what we do in here. What does Romans 12 one say? Uh, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And that little phrase there, which is your reasonable service, if you look at some other translations, it'll say, which is your spiritual act of worship, that we commit ourselves to God, we surrender ourselves to God, we dedicate ourselves to God. Y'all, that's worship. I'm going to tell you something. You are never going to feel worship in here if you are not dedicated to Christ out there. Let's just mark it down. All right? You are not going to feel worship in here. You are not going to experience true worship in here if you are not committed to living for God out there. And it's time for us to repair this altar. The altar represented a place of sacrifice. It represented a place of prayer. It represented a place of worship. It represented a place of faith. And if we want our best days to be, to be before us, we are going to have to repair the altar of God. And it's going to have to be God's altar. Look, it's, it's time. And, and really, I guess, where it really is, it's about our commitment. It's about our devotion. It's about our dedication. Ah, oh, this is a killer, man. You know, too many people have too much knowledge. Right? Right? And they think because they know so much that, that they're living it out and their devotion and their commitment has simply been chopped off. What's the key? What do I say? What you do says more about what you believe than what you say. What you do says more about what you believe than what you say. The proof is in the pudding, as they say. It's really what I live out and it's really what I allow to be a part of my life. In, in, in verse 21 of chapter 18, it says that Elijah came to all the people and he said, how long are you going to falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people didn't answer him, not a word. They didn't even respond. But here's what I'm trying to say today. Listen, if it's the world, then go that way. But if it's God, then go that way. It is time for us today to make 
make a choice. It's time for us today to quit trying to live in both worlds. It's time for us to quit offering up spiritual sacrifices to God on altars of the world. It's time for us to have a commitment and a dedication to serve the Lord as the people of God right here in this community. It is time for us to make a choice. You remember when Moses came down off, off of a... Uh, um, Mount Sinai and the people had built the calf and they had built the golden calf and, and Aaron, Aaron meets him there when, he, when he's coming down and it's in Exodus chapter 32 and it's in verse 26 and Moses knows what's happened and Aaron has kind of made excuses, you know, hey, you know how these people are, you know, and they asked me to make them something, da, 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 whatever. And Moses, it says, stood in the entry of the camp. He stood in the entry of the camp and he said, if you are on the Lord's side, then you come join me right here. I got to tell you, I feel like today I'm drawing a line and I'm saying it is time to choose. It's time to make a choice. If our best days are going to be for us, then we are going to have to choose to be the people of God in this community. In case you haven't noticed, I'm going to give you a little clue. I've said this before, but in case you didn't hear it, I want you to hear it now. My purpose in being here is not to build a great social club and a great social network. My purpose in being here is not so that you can have all of your felt needs met. My purpose in being here is not to build a support group for you to lean on and, 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 and to be suckled and nursed along. My purpose for being here is to raise up a people of God empowered by the Spirit of God intent upon showing forth the glory glory of God right here in this community. That is my purpose. I'm not a counselor. Look, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a trained counselor. Do I do counseling? Sure. I, whatever I need to do. But let me tell you something. I'm not here so that every aspect of your life can be fixed only if it's fixed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You want to know the answer to fixing your life? It's not in some knowledge that I have. It's not in some wisdom. It's not in support that the church provides. It is in you making a choice to serve Jesus Christ. Amen. It is in you. It is in your choice. It's time to repair the altar. I'm like Elijah. How long are you going to dance between these two opinions? How long are you going to go back and forth? If God is God, then serve Him. And if Baal is God, then serve them. But make a choice. We looked at the letters of Revelation on Wednesday night. And to the church at Laodicea, he told them, he said, Look, you're not hot and you're not cold. In other words, you haven't made a choice. He said, You're lukewarm. You're trying to ride the fence. You're trying to be neutral. He says, As a result of that, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Those are the words of Jesus. You're not hot and you're not cold, so I'm going to spit you right out of my mouth. It's time to make a choice. Jesus says in Matthew uh, chapter 6, I believe it's in Matthew chapter 6, and it's in verse 24, he says, look, you can't serve two masters because you're either going to hate one and love the other or you're going to be devoted to the one and you're going to despise the other one. No one can serve, he says, God and man. But, but the principle applies to anything, not just money. You can't serve two masters. You can't be surrendered to two masters. It's time to make a choice. The choice we make will determine who we become as a church in this community. Well, Brother Keith, here's... here's Here's another problem that we have. Brother Keith, I get what you're saying and everything. But I mean, I'm just me. I'm just, just a regular old guy. And I know, Brother Keith, I know that you say you're a regular old guy. And I know that you say that you're just an old redneck, which I am. But, you know, obviously you have something that I don't have. It's not true unless you're lost, by the way. If, if I have something you don't have, it's because you're lost, all right? Um, but, 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 but this is, you know, and, and I talked about this when we talked about faith and when we were preaching, when I was preaching through Hebrews chapter 11. We have this idea that true people of faith, people who are mighty in faith and people who are mighty in prayer and people who are mighty in following the Lord, that, that they are somehow the spiritual elite, Right? And that they, they, they are the spiritual elite. And so they are going to have these privileges and they're going to do these things that maybe the rest of us don't really have or do. Enter Elijah. Elijah wasn't in Hebrews chapter 11, by the way. And I, right now, I'm, after looking at this, I'm like, why did they leave Elijah out, right? 
Elijah was obviously a man of great faith. But who was Elijah? Where was he from? Answer out loud. Where was Elijah from? Well, so it says that in 17 verse 1, it says that Elijah was a what? Tishbite. So he was from Tishba? Tish? Tishba or Tish, either one. Other than Elijah being from there, tell me one significant thing biblically that has ever happened in Tishba or Tish. Yeah. I said other than Elijah was from there. <laughs> Biblical archaeologists don't even know where this place was. We know from 17.1 it was in the, the area known as Gilead. The best they can do is come up with this. This was probably just some little country town. May not even have been a town. It may have just been a little hole in the wall country area that Elijah is from. Elijah was a Middle Eastern redneck. I'm serious. He was just a country boy. He was just a country boy from a little country town. And, but, but guess what? He was a person of God empowered by the Spirit of God and he was intent upon showing forth the glory of God. He didn't have the right manners. He didn't have the right education. He wasn't polished. And the first thing we know is we see him, he's obviously not afraid of anything. Of course, most country boys are too dumb to be afraid of anything. No, I'm teasing. Actually, I'm not teasing. But you know, he's obviously not afraid of anything. He's standing in the palace and he says to the king, guess what? It ain't gonna rain again until I say so. Well, hello. He was just a guy. James says that Elijah was a, man, was a man just like we are. He had the same spirit that we do. Let me tell you something. Faith, prayer, devotion, and commitment, those are not for the spiritual elite. Those are for, those are for everybody who claims the name of Christ. Those are for every person who claims to walk with God. Those are for every person sitting right here in this pew, in a pew in this room right now today, who claims to be and is an actual child of God. And it is time for you, it is time for me, it is time for us, it is time for us to choose who we're going to be. And it is time for us to choose to be the people of God committed to God. I don't care if we're just a little church in a little community. Guess what? This little community needs this church here. I don't care if, if we're just regular old folks. That's who they need. They just need regular old folks. Regular old folks whose, name, whose lives have been changed by the power of God who can show forth the glory of God. That's who they need. It's time for us to repair the altar of commitment. It's time for us to repair the altar of, of devotion and to make this commitment and to make this devotion to the Lord. It's, look, it's, it's just time. It's time to be, I, I'm like this, I like this. I just thought of this just within the last few days and I like it. It's time for us to be the people of God empowered by the Spirit of God showing forth the glory of God. Because that's where it's gonna end right here. I ain't got there yet, but I'm gonna get there in a minute. I guess one of the main things about building the altar and I wanna back up and, and, and repair, we need to repair the altar of faith. Now I just finished preaching a whole series of sermons on faith, and, and I want to kind of, kind of re-hit on that again. But, but we need to, to be the people of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, and showing forth the glory of God. We're going to have to be a people who have faith in God. Now, what is faith? What did I say faith was? There's three things. Hearing, hearing from God, believing. believing God, and acting upon it. We need to hear from God, we need to believe what he says, and then we need to live it out. So as soon as uh, Elijah uh, pronounces this pronouncement in, in uh, chapter 17, right after that, starting in verse 2, um, God tells Elijah to go into the mountains and to go by this brook, and it's this brook called Cherith. And while he's there, the ravens are going to feed him, and he's going to get water from the brook. So he follows the Lord, and he goes, and he spends some time by this brook. Well, guess what happens? The brook dries up, which would make sense since there was a drought. The brook dries up. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Didn't God send him there? Isn't that where God told him to go? 
Didn't he hear from God and believe God? And didn't he live it out and then go and do what God said? And he did and he went there and the brook dried up? Let me ask you this. Are you willing to still have faith when things don't work out the way you think they're supposed to work out? Hmm? You know, the truth is, he was right where God wanted him to be. The truth is, he was exactly where God told him to be. He was exactly where ta God told him to go. But when God decides he wants to do things a little bit differently, and when God decides he needs to work in your life differently so that he can strengthen your faith every step of the way, which you can just follow along in a minute, and you'll see the, the, that the faith challenges get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But let me ask you something. Are you going to quit on God when God doesn't do what you think he ought to do when he ought to do it? That's not who we need. We need to be a people who hear from God, who, who, who believe God, and who live on, act on what God has said. We need to have a tenacity to our faith, a tenacity that will not stop when God does something differently. So, so he's at, there at the brook Cherith, that dries up, and so then uh, God tells him, he says, uh, and it starts in verse 8, he says, I want you to go down to this little place called Zarephath, and you get to Zarephath, and there's going to be this widow lady there, and this widow lady is going to take care of you. So here goes um, Elijah, and he gets to Zarephath, he goes into town, I guess he sits by the, by the well or whatever, and he sees this widow lady. Okay, so, so far so good, right? Everything just like God said, go to Zarephath, you're going to see what it is, so he sees a widow lady. There's probably more than one widow lady in, in Zarephath, but apparently he saw this one, apparently he felt like this was the one, and uh, she gives him something to drink, and he says, oh, um, by the way, he said, would you bring me something to eat? And, and I'm, I know I'm giving you the Brother Keith version, but you can read it. It starts in verse 8. And she turns around and she looks at him. And she says, look, I ain't got anything to eat. She says, in fact, I have just enough flour and enough oil to make one little cake of bread. She said, in fact, what I'm doing right now is I'm gathering up some sticks. I'm going to make a fire. I'm going to cook it. I'm going to feed it to my son and I. And then we're going to sit down and wait to die. Because it's over for us. Really, God, this is the widow who's supposed to take care of me? Right? Now, that's not what Elijah said. That's what you and I would have said. It's what we would have said. If, Eli if God said, go down to Zarephath, there's going to be a widow there. She's going to take care of you. We get down to Zarephath. We look at the widow and we say, hey, bring me something to eat. And she says, I ain't got nothing to eat. In fact, I'm starving to death as we speak. And I'm fixing to eat the last little bit of what I got. And then me and my son, we're going to starve to death and we're going to die. You know what we would have said? Sorry, got the wrong widow. Right? Tell me I'm wrong. Convince me that I'm wrong. We would have said, oh no, this door is closed. I cringe. I'm just going to let you in on a little secret. I cringe inside when I hear people talking about their obedience to God's will based upon open doors and closed doors. I cringe. When I look at the will of God in the Bible, so many times the doors are closed. They are closed. I got the wrong widow. But he didn't say that. He didn't say that at all. God sent him there. He knew that was the widow God wanted him, uh, uh, that, that God had ordained to take care of him. So instead of saying, oh, sorry, I got the wrong widow, he decided to have enough faith to open up that door to produce the miracle of God. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, just do this for me. He said, you bake a little cake for me first. For me. First, you do it for me. And after you do it for me, then you bake one for yourself and your son. And then we'll just see. And every day from that point on, there was enough flour, there was enough oil for her to have enough to feed her family and to feed Elijah. Because she baked one for him first. We need a faith that's not put off by a closed door. See, I didn't get many amens on that. And that's okay. We need a faith that can kick open some closed doors. We need a faith that's willing to go wherever God tells us to go against whatever circumstances God may raise up in our, fa in, in our face. We need to have a faith that not only hears from God, that tells us to go to a place, we need to hear from God, and then we need to believe that what He said is true. So strong that we are going to be unrelenting and we are not going to stop and we are not going to quit and we are not going to back down. And we're going to keep moving forward and keep taking, taking forward steps. So then guess what happens? 
I mean, Elijah can't win for losing. So they experienced this miracle. And then one day, what happens to her son? Does anybody know? He's dead. They wake up one day and he's dead. What are you going to do then? Wait a minute, God. You sent me down here. I, I had enough faith to come. She didn't have any food. I had enough faith to stay with her and, and had enough faith so that you were providing for us and we're experiencing this miracle. Now what are you doing? This, the kid is dead. He's dead. What are you doing? Here, let me let you know a little secret. So whatever he did, and I don't remember, I think he went in there and like stretched himself out on the body three times or something like that. That's not really the part of my sermon. That's why I'm, I'm not really explaining it. The, the main part that I want to express as far as what's part of my sermon, there had never been a resurrection from the dead up to this point in the Bible. It hadn't happened. There, there wasn't one. So what I'm telling you is, there was no process. There was no method. There was no step one, step two, step three, boom, he'll be raised from the dead. You know what he had to do? He had to depend on his relationship with God. He had to simply follow the leadership of God. Listen, and I get it. I, I understand we're people and we want, I want, if I do step one and if I do step two and if I do step three, boom, we're going to be the perfect church. If we do step one, if we do step two, if we do step three, boom, our marriage is going to be okay. If we do step one, if we do step two, if we do step three, boom, we're going to raise the perfect children. I'm going to tell you what, you can take all those steps, wad them up and throw them in the garbage, Okay. Because there are no steps that are going to do that. There are no steps that are going to heal your marriage. There are no steps that are going to make your kids perfect. There are no steps that are going to make us a great church. What is going to make us who we need to be? And what is going to make a difference in your marriage and in your family and in whatever other, other place you find yourself is living in an active, open, vibrant relationship with the living God. That's what it is. It is being a people of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, trying to show forth the glory of God. There is no process for Christianity. There is no method and steps for you to take for Christianity. It is a relationship. And as a people of God, we're going to have to live in a relationship with God so that we can hear his voice and he can give us guidance. And that's what we need. That's what we have to do here. And it's time today to decide if that's what we're going to do or not. It's time today to make that choice. How long are we going to dance back and forth between two opinions? We need to choose today. Um, <clears throat> so he calls everybody together. Elijah does. And you know the story how he, he douses the altar. He makes it wet. He digs a, digs a trench around it. Uh, makes the altar wet, the sacrifice wet. Fills the trench with, with water. And he's going to call down fire. And the fire is going to... Um, it's going to lick up even the water that's in the trench. Verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and he said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Egypt, Isaac and Egypt, Isaac and Israel, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day, one, that you are God in Israel. I am your servant and I have done everything at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are God and that you have hurt, turned their hearts back to you. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. When you had this man of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, he showed up and the glory of God became evident. Fire fell. And when that fire fell, all the people acknowledged that the Lord was God, that Jehovah was God, and they fell on their faces and they worshiped him. Listen. The truth is, oh, we have nothing of eternal significance to offer our community other than the presence of the living God, other than the salvation of the living God. And that's what we need to seek to give to them. And we need to seek to let the glory of God be evident 
through us in this community so that people can believe and turn their hearts. I, I did this in a little prayer. I looked at this as a little prayer because, listen, this is a great little prayer that, you, that we can pray and we can pray it for our church. The first thing he prayed about was he said, you know, you are God. Well, let's just walk through it. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. Let's pray that God would make himself known in our community that he is the one true God. And he says, and that I am your servant and that I have done all your things at your word. So this, this isn't intended to be, to point at us at all. But we, what we need people to know is that what we do is because we serve the Lord and not because we're charitable people and not because we're nice people and not because we're good people or whatever. We need the, or the community to know that we do what we do because we serve the Lord and because we have heard from him and are doing what he has asked us to do. So we need to pray that God would show the community uh, who he is. We need to pray that God would show him. And, and I, if he's going to show them, it's because we're going to have to be that. If he, He's going to show them that what we do is, is, is in obedience to the Lord and obedience uh, to what he's got. And so, so that these people can know that you're a Lord and that they have turned their back upon you. And so that these people can come to a place of repentance so that they can turn themselves to you. Ask God, show himself to our community. Let them see him. Let them know that what we do isn't about us as a church, but it's about God himself. And let them see his glory so that they can turn their hearts back and believe in him. And when was the last time when was the last time we prayed for something like revival to come to our neighborhood? When was the last time we prayed for something that wasn't about me? It wasn't about my little house. It wasn't about my little corner of the world. When was the last time that we asked God to glorify himself through us and to show the community who he is so that they could turn to him? Our best days can be ahead of us, but it depends on the choice we make. And it's time. It's time to decide. It's time to make a choice about who we're going to be. You know, do we just want to be this place where everybody can come and have a little feel-good, warm, fuzzy, touchy-feely, not even touchy-feely, but just a real good, you know what I mean, just a warm, fuzzy, and everybody walks just feeling great about themselves because they never do anything wrong and they're all just wonderful? Or do we want to be the people of God, empowered by God's Holy Spirit, showing forth the glory of God in this community? That's where I'm trying to lead us. I'm just, let, just in case there's any question, that's where I'm leading. That's where I'm leading. And so, so today I'm asking, who's going with me? Who's going with me? It's time to decide. It's time to decide today. Stand up with me if you would. I don't, look, I don't know. I guess really the invitation is pretty, pretty evident. As the people of God, who are you going to decide to be? Boils down to your devotion, your commitment, the decision that you make. Maybe today you need, and I, I know this really wasn't a gospel-centered message, but maybe today, maybe God has been piercing your heart about the gospel and about receiving him as your savior. And that is certainly the first step. And maybe today's the day that you want to take that step. Love to pray with you about that. Whatever you need to do, if you need to do anything today, make any kind of public decision, I'd love to talk with you about that. If you just want me to pray with you about something, I'd love to pray with you about whatever you want. If you need to come forward for any reason this morning, you come while we sing softly and tenderly.